Joining us now are attorneys from Marsh Law Firm. It is Maggie and Helene. Welcome to the show. How are you both? Great. How are you? Wonderful. I thank you so much for being here. Um, it's such an important topic, and I wanted to be able to bring you on so that we could bring about awareness. So you specialize in helping people that have been exploited due to sexual abuse. What made you decide to specialize in that area? So it's... A tough question. I mean, Maggie and I both have different reasons for wanting to work with these sort of survivors. I started my career out in a Special Victims Bureau, prosecuting these cases criminally, and the rewarding feeling that you get when you're able to secure justice for survivors like this, um, there's really no other feeling like it. So for me, it was about helping the community, and not a lot of people can stomach this kind of work, and I learned that I can stomach it, so someone's got to do it. Why not us? And and I think, you know, we do see a lot of pain, but we see so much more strength. We get to work for some of the strongest women and children in the world, and that is why we do what we do. Getting into this field, you may not see that until you're there, but once you are, um, it's a very beautiful thing, and it's, it's wonderful to support survivors in this way. I didn't realize how prevalent it is. I don't think people realize they think, oh, well, that yeah. happens to someone else's family or that happens somewhere else or in that neighborhood or we don't talk about that. But that's not the case, sadly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I, I do think that understanding how prevalent it is helps mitigate that shame for a lot of survivors. Knowing that it is common and, and telling people how you know it's common helps survivors feel comfortable coming forward, talking about what happened to them. We as a society, I think, should acknowledge how this happens a lot and, and it's normal so that survivors don't feel ostracized or out of the picture when they come forward with what happened to them. It's a taboo topic and people don't want to bring it up. It's, it's so sensitive that it's something that hasn't been commonly talked about in mom's groups or you know when you're talking to your friends but now that our society is realizing that this is really an epidemic and it's really something that can be prevented if you're having those sort of conversations with your neighbors with your community with your children most importantly um, so you know there is now more of a widespread awareness but it's much more common than than you'd think when you're going through this with someone, are you also giving them like a social worker or someone that they can talk to about it? Because the legal system, you know, you're you're going in and you're digging deep and you're getting all that yeah. painful information out. Sure. Is there somebody on your team or someone that you refer to them too? So, okay. you know, we often deal with psychiatrists, social workers, therapists. We make sure that our clients have the ability to access the resources that they need to get through this. We always say, you know, we have to work the cases, they have to live it. Being a litigant is not easy work. And we bring up a lot of old trauma in what we do. We bring up some of their worst nightmares and they do need, you know, to get therapy, to be able to get through the litigation process itself. Something that we use a lot in our practice and that I've seen our clients do really well with is uh, EMD eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, it has worked wonders with some of our very traumatized clients who really need to get through litigation. Yeah, it's amazing. What does the acronym C-SAM stand for? What is C-SAM? Sure. So you may know it as child pornography. That is an outdated term. The word pornography gives this connotation that what's being depicted is consensual or a sexual activity that, that two people engaged in willingly. That's just not the case when you're dealing with children. And uh, it, the term child sex abuse material is a more accurate description of what is really being depicted, the torture and abuse and the crime scene, the digital crime scene that is you know, child pornography. And so survivors have said time and time again, let's call it CSAM, that's what it is. It acknowledges that I was abused and doesn't give this connotation that I enjoyed it or participated or had consented to it. So while the legal community is still, in some senses, referring to it as child pornography, in our industry, the way we specialize as a way to respect our clients and our survivors, we are calling it CSAM. Makes a big difference. It does. What is the statute of limitations? I know sure. that it was August of 2019 there was some sort of legislation that you had to file a case, I believe, by a certain date. Sure. So okay. there have been a lot of recent enactments to extend statute of limitations. You can basically look at a statute of limitations as a timeline or a clock. Um, you only have a certain amount of time for every type of lawsuit where you're allowed to file. And unfortunately for survivors of sexual abuse, that limitation has been so restrictive 
And it's a huge problem for survivors because the research and the data that we now know coming out of organizations like Child USA is that most survivors of child sexual abuse don't disclose their abuse until they're in their 50s. So mm -hmm. having a statute of limitations that's five years, 10 years, 15 years, that doesn't do anything for these survivors at all. So in 2019, New York opened this statute called the Child Victims Act, and there were two years, because of COVID it was extended, where survivors had an opportunity to file a lawsuit. Whether they're 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, they could now seek justice for the crimes that happened against them when they were a child, either at school, either as a parishioner at a Catholic church, in foster care, in various agencies around the state of New York, they gave them the power to file a lawsuit to seek some justice. And so we have hundreds of clients that we represent under the Child Victims Act. How do you feel currently about um, what the punishment is for the crime? Do they need to have stricter, you know, or more, I guess, robust punishments? And, and I think a part of it is not necessarily punishment, but we need to change this behavior. We need to keep the institutions that enable this abuse accountable. They mm -hmm. need to be able to spot the red flags when they see an abuser. They need to be able to make a child feel safe in coming forward when they've been abused. They need to be able to respond to that abuse in a way that you know builds their strength and their courage so that the truth can come out and we can stop the bad guys. Unfortunately, we see far too many times that maybe the perpetrator has been uh, faced some sort of punishment, but the institutions that allowed that perpetrator to, to do what he did for so long or, or continue on abusing kids for decades, if not longer, it, it's been really, really difficult to bring that level of institutional accountability up until we had the Child Victims Act window, which allowed us to, for the first time to really dig in deep in these institutions that have enabled abuse for, for far too long. And um, the statute of limitations on the child sex abuse material, the other words, child yes. pornography, is right. a little different. Um, that last year, uh, we actually removed the SOL on that. There is no SOL. So at this point in time, and it is because we acknowledge through all of the work that happened in New York, that people don't come forward about this. Why are we putting a time bar on justice? Let's make sure that there's no time limit for this. Uh, so if, if material is created of your abuse, you do end up with a different SOL. And um, the window did close in August of, of 2021. So those who were abused and whose claims did lapse and they no longer have an active SOL, they still are prevented from seeking justice. So there is, you know, all the more reason for us to open another window in New York. <laughs> yeah, open it up, right? Yeah. And, and awareness. At what age do you feel, or, or how, how can, um, as adults, how can we communicate to our to the children and to the youth, whether we're the parent or we're the school nurse or we're the teacher? How, how do we, you know, right? How do we help someone protect their own personal space? Like it's not okay for you to touch me, or it's not okay what you did. Like, right? How do we help them have a voice? So. It's what I like to say, and as someone who is a new mom, and I'm thinking about all these things, and I've also been doing this work for several years, you want to have these open and honest conversations with your kids as early as appropriate. Okay. So first thing is teaching your child proper body parts and what real body parts are so that if something horrible were to happen, your child has that capacity to come to you or to come to a trusted adult in their life, like that school guidance counselor, and tell them that something happened using those correct terminologies, which can sometimes be misconstrued in the process if they're calling certain things not the right name. Mm -hmm. Also having open, honest uh, conversations with your kids about their social media use, you know? There's identifying information that kids and teenagers are putting out there, like their school, when they graduate, public profiles, all these identifying things that you can have conversations with your children, and if you create this environment that's open, your child is much more likely to come to you when that sort of thing happens. Yeah, and I think this sounds like really practical advice, but kids need to know that they cannot take their clothes off on camera. This Correct. is something that um, we're yeah. seeing it become normalized in yep. society. It's horrible. And it's allowing abusers to sextort and attack and, and make prey out of children who are often just a few clicks away. Yep. And so we see this, and it is related to the hands-on abuse that we've encountered and, and litigated cases about. Um, but more and more, we're seeing this go digital, and we're seeing crimes against kids happen without ever having to lay a, a finger on them. Yeah, it's, a, it's an entryway. 
It's yeah. Insane. So what's happening is, is like maybe they're being bullied into it, or they think yeah. it's funny, or they think, oh, Snapchat, it's going to go away in a few seconds, and sometimes it right. doesn't. And they think because, it's a peer. They correct. think it's a peer their right. age, and that it's okay yep. to send a, a photo to you know someone who is their age, and maybe it is, but that's not actually someone their age on the on the other side. And I frankly, I say maybe because I don't believe it's it's okay. I do think it's really normal in the society that we live in today and unpacking that normal world that we live in and trying to change it, talking to our kids about why this should be different, even just for them. Maybe all your friends are doing it, but you shouldn't do it because it's gonna be better for you. Yeah, right. personal and, respect overall. And an image lasts forever. I mean, we now know, you know, 10, 20 years ago before Facebook and MySpace and all these sort of social media sites blew up, people were posting things without sort of realizing the consequences of their actions. Well, now we know that an image on the internet lasts forever. So when it's digitalized CSAM material, there is nothing more devastating for a client. And, and we can't stop the spread. We can help control it. We can yes. try and limit it. It is big tech that we need to hold accountable to actually be able to fix this problem. And we're living in an industry where, unfortunately, profits go before children. And we're seeing it time and time again. So what we need to do is focus on telling our kids, how do you come forward about this when it's happened? It, studies have shown that um, it takes exactly one supportive survivor to change the trajectory of a child's trauma, whether they're going to build from that and move forward in a progressive way or deteriorate really depends on how that first person they told reacted. So, you yeah. know, being parents that react in a way that's supportive to kids and um, doesn't blame them, understands the, the perils of the situation, but also hugs them through it. I love that. Thank you very, very much for being here. I know it's not the easiest subject. I appreciate that you decided that you were going to be champions for this and you're going to be advocates for others. It's really Wow, it's, it's so impressive, and thank I thank you, you so, so much, because I know you're winning cases, and I know <laughs> that you're doing good work, and you're making a difference, so thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you having Donna. us. If you know anybody that is, like, traumatized or needs help in any way, whether it's happened in the past or it's happening currently, please just wake up and say something. Go get help. We care about you and your family.